Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, this channel is all about vermicomposting on a household scale. And right now we are in my basement and this is my 55 gallon drum, which everyone affectionately calls blue. Now, you might see something, if you're not new here, off to the side here, that uh, is rather odd for me. Um, I've got kind of a boo-boo, and as I've always said, I don't use gloves unless my hand has uh, any sort of a, you know, problem, like a cut or a burn or something. So I will be wearing gloves today to protect me from any um, soil organisms that uh, may hurt me. So first of all, what we're gonna do here is uh, we're going to do a bit of a harvest on my end of my wedge here. And um, as you can tell, if you're not new here, it is starting to go down. I have been coming down here once or twice a week to sift off a little bit, and I am getting somewhere. I just take off the part that is dry enough to sift, and then you will see here in a moment, I'll put a, a good handful in here. And if you like these sifters here, I do have a link below in my Amazon links. These things have lasted for more than five years now. I use them for bonsai soil as well as for sifting my worm castings. Okay, so I am going to throw the overs at the eating end of the bin there. And I'm probably getting greater than 50% right now, which is uh, about par for the course. So if you're ever wondering, you know, um, what is a good harvest? 50% and then the rest of this stuff is either paper that hasn't dissolved, wood, um, anytime there's any plastic, I pick that out. But yeah, about 50, 50 or 60% ending up in the bottom is good for me, and then I put this back through to get eaten again. So blue is going to get a very big uh, move today. We're going to move over a lot, and then we are going to give him a very big feeding today and a big addition in bedding. It is getting to be that season where I need the castings, so blue needs to kick it in gear so that I can get all of this harvested and get some new stuff started. I'm going to be starting my onions and my super hots today. Now, um, I think it's called Miko's Garden. He had a video about the one seed challenge and I'm gonna go ahead and join that. So Miko, if you're watching, I am gonna probably do a short in regards to my one seed challenge. But, so I'm going to obviously, gonna need some seed starting mix, which of course, uh, fresh vermicompost is a, about a 20 to 25% component of my seed starting mix. I use regular potting mix for the base, just to, you know, yield whatever's cheap at uh, the big box store. And then I add some either perlite or vermiculite, whatever I have handy. Sometimes around where I live, you can't get one or the other. I use them interchangeably, although um, vermiculite does tend to hold on to water uh, more than perlite does. So you do kind of have to watch that. And then usually when I get done with my seed starting, all the uh, leftover comes back into blue here. So it's kind of a cycle. So there are some things that just never go away in blue and it just becomes like large size or large pore size that ends up helping keep the air into the worm bin. So you can see per the wedge system, and I'll, I'll put a diagram up above, but per the wedge system, you start feeding at this end and little by little, you just keep adding more. And then as things start to compress and go down as the composting happening happens, then you just kind of scrunch it up and always feed new stuff at the leading edge. The way I run this here, it is a never ending system. It's the worm bin that never ends. And so basically this goes continuously and it's been going continuously for about two years now. I did have a minor hiccup where there was a rat in the basement where I had to disassemble blue to save the worms. 
but uh, other than that, the wor this doesn't ever get 100% harvested. I only harvest this end of the bin that the worms have, for the most part, vacated and the castings have dried enough for me to sift. Now you know that you can't, you know that you cannot sift when you get to the point where you start getting these little pea-sized balls of vermicompost, and um, that's when you stop because otherwise you're just going to make these really hard little balls and they will not go through the screen even though they're pure compost. All right, well we got a pretty good haul today. Let me go put this in my finished casting bin. Okay, so that's pretty good. We managed to get about another uh, half inch. So I think that was pretty good. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to, and a lot of people don't agree with fluffing, so if you don't agree, that's totally fine. You do you. I'm showing you what I do, not claiming to be an expert. I'm, sure, I'm simply showing you what has worked for me. I have never had a large batch of worms die. Um, so I'm going to consider that a success. Therefore, that's what I do. Um, everybody does something different or everybody does something a little bit different. And that is totally fine because if you live in some place that is way drier or way wetter than me, then your process is not going to be exactly the same. And you know, it is not a cookie cutter kind of a system that everybody can say, thou shalt do this recipe and you will get a good vermicompost. It is not that way. And I just wanna make sure that everybody knows that, unfortunately, if you ask me questions in the comments, like, hey, um, how much of this or how long for that? A lot of times the answer is it will depend greatly on what the temperature is that you're composting at, what food you're feeding, what kind of worms you have. Um, lots of things like what is available to you. You know, I feed mostly kitchen scraps and yard scraps. And I use uh, cardboard and paper bedding. I also use some leaves. But unless your situation is exactly the same as mine, sometimes you just have to feel it out and make mistakes. Like uh, I've had a lot of problems maintaining a stable moisture in the winter time because in the basement here, it, is, uh, it gets very, very dry because the furnace is in the same room as the worm bin. So right now I'm not fluffing for any other reason than to make sure that the air is in there and that it's not compacted. So one of the things that's the big enemy of worm bins is too much moisture and not enough moisture. Worms are like 90% moisture and that is how they breathe. And if it gets to the point where it's compacted in there and it is still composting, it's going to release gases like carbon dioxide and methane, ammonia, things like that, which will hurt the worms. So by fluffing, what I'm doing is I'm making sure that there's enough air pockets in the worm compost so that the worms can breathe and so that I don't end up with anaerobic um, conditions. So as you can see, there was hardly any worms in that, but as I'm moving over here, I am getting to a part that has some worms. It's kind of a sparse population, but there are some worms here. Now, as I move these guys over, I'm building up higher and higher, and they will experience drier conditions, which will make them want to move this way, which is why the wedge works. You know, there might be a little bit of food left over here, but uh, even if there is food, they will move with the moisture. So if it is the same moisture all the way across, you might not get them to move. Now, in my case here, I have been trying to reduce the number of bins in my wormery. So I started um, harvesting bins and putting the uh, finished castings on top of blue here. So I kind of screwed up my own wedge, but eventually all the worms will move to that end of the bin. So we're not quite to the halfway mark here. Generally, there is very little worms until you get to that point. But the moisture is still very good here. 
so the worms will continue to move unless I dry it out. So I'm just gonna keep chipping away here, but you can tell the moisture here is pretty high. So I'm going to continue moving everything over and hopefully fluffing it so that it dries out. Okay, so peanuts, the peanut shell that's not blended up, I think it's been in here for two years. Um, my advice, if you have fresh dry peanuts, uh, maybe wash the salt off of them, put them in a blender and turn them into powder and feed them that way. Otherwise you're going to be seeing them for actual years. You could put them in the outside compost if you wanted to, but I do almost, I would say 90% of my kitchen scraps go into my worms. All right, we got some pumpkin sprouts here. So, okay, so we're getting really wet now. And uh, I, I remember saying that some, you know, all of the Amazon tape is compostable. Not actually all of it. There are the, um, and I'm not sure why they use one tape in one place and other tape in another. There is this blue and black tape that is plasticky that is not compostable. The stuff that I've had the best luck with is the paper tape. Some people say that certain batches of it actually have like a polyester um, strings through it. Um, I'm starting to wonder if that's what this is. I'm going to give it a chance. I'm going to keep pushing it down. Um, but as far as I was told, it was compostable. But if it turns out that there's polyester strings in there, then I guess I will just have to pull the polyester strings out later. All right, so we're getting into more and more worm density here and also higher and higher moisture. And as I find things that are large, I just push them down to the feeding end. All right, so I'm going to get him built up again this way. Not sure if that was what that tape came from. But you know, it, it you pull it out, you do the evaluation of the bin, and uh, that's why I go through here very carefully, is that I uh, have an opportunity to not only get the air to the bin, but also find any weird things that may have, chicken bones, may have come in on something that I was not aware of. So, you know, I don't intentionally put any plastic in here or anything. But I do try to compost everything I can, and sometimes when I'm pushing the limits, uh, I do get things that don't compost and uh, live and learn. That's what I'm all about. Um, not a professional worm farmer. There are some professionals out there. But uh, my goal is to take care of my household wastes and keep it from going in the landfill. So my goal is not to grow worms super fast. It's just to, you know, get rid of the garbage, mostly. So I think I would take different steps if I was going to try and do this professionally. But what I'm doing right now, it works. Okay, we're getting close. We've, we've hit the middle line. You can tell how much more moisture there is in this. This is much wetter. So this particular part probably was fed three months ago. You can kind of tell the difference in the color from here to here. This is much darker and much crumblier, whereas this is kind of muddy. Okay. Oh, chicken bone. Chicken bone is left over from my experiment where I was feeding meat. So it is, uh, <laughs> we'll see how long it takes them to eat chicken bones or it takes the system to dissolve a chicken bone. I don't expect the worms to chew on a chicken bone. I would be super surprised if I saw that. Okay, so if you've been here for a while, you know that I've got a problem with wanting to grow avocados. So that's what that is. That's one of the black avocados that I got last year. So I'm gonna see if I can't grow a black avocado seedling 
here in zone five doesn't make much sense, but you know, why not? I like to bonsai things. All right, so we have come through the more finished end of the bin now. I'm gonna move you over to the business end of the bin where I feed. Okay, here we are at the business end of it, and you can see how fine the castings are right where the food was. Good job, worms. Just gonna kinda go through that a little bit and move it over to the middle here. Keep shifting. Probably won't get to any kind of a worm ball until we get to the far end over there. But you'll see sticks and stems in here from uh, anytime plants die in my house, then they get to be processed by the worms. And a lot of them are long-term food, like this mango pit. But I think their benefit is, is similar to like when you have a outside compost pile, having sticks and stems in the outside compost pile actually is, is helpful to uh, keep air in there. If everything's really super compacted, then it becomes anaerobic and your compost doesn't work very well. And it ends up stinking. Cork. Hopefully that will start to make progress in my lifetime. All right, we're getting there. Another avocado, I'm not sure. I just see worms getting in the crack there, so I'm not sure if they're gonna grow that avocado or eat it. They don't usually consult me with their plans. Um, there we go. So you can see the population of worms has totally increased here. And the moisture is higher. Finding some leaves in here that are not digested. Pick out some little bits of plastic. There we go. And we got some sprouts. We'll keep moving them down. The feeding for today is the last of my pumpkin. And uh, I did have that out in the garage and it started to degrade on its own. <laughs> so uh, we've had quite a few warm spells where it's been into the 70s here. And uh, so the pumpkin uh, must have had some, I don't know, flaws in it or something and started to rot on me. So it is a good, good time to get rid of the rest of it. Okay, worms. Okay, looks like they're growing more avocados. It usually takes about six months to get rid of an avocado seed, but when it does go, look at that. Looks like mashed potatoes. And of course the worms weren't the ones that did that. That's the bacteria and the fungus and the roly polies and all the other critters that lived in the bin. But now that it's all broken up, now the worms can eat it. And that's how a lot of the slow food, I had a question about what is slow food and how do you know? And honestly, it's, it's experience. You know, what foods, you know, when you feed every two weeks or so, um, you know, if it's gone after two weeks, I would definitely consider it a fast food. If it is still there after two weeks and you have a couple pounds of worms, of course, depending on how much you fed, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's slow food at that point if it takes more than a couple of weeks for it to break down. So obviously avocado pits are super long-term food. A lot of times they turn this orange color right before they turn into paste. All right, we're getting to it now. We may get to see some worm balls. 
So I'm just gonna brush the dry, dry stuff down here and then maybe we can catch a worm ball. It's been about three weeks since we've been in here. So I'm not sure. We did feed a lot of food. In case anybody's wondering, I'm really not enjoying working with gloves here. <laughs> I usually never have gloves on, but that cut on my finger is pretty deep. Definitely did not want to take the chance of jamming any sort of uh, strep bacteria or anything that could be in the soil here. I also recommend if you have uh, immune problems, you probably should also wear gloves. Because there, you know, you can catch certain things being in a worm bin, skin infections, etc. All right, worms. Looks like uh, the food that I fed them last time, I'll have to put a picture below, but I'm not feeling or seeing any of the worm balls. Oh well, you can't get a worm ball every time, but there's a sort of a worm ball. There is a bunch of worms on top of an avocado pit. So it is a ball and it has worms. Kind of counts. There's like a really high density of worms here, but no actual cool feeding frenzy worm ball. But with this big of an area, I don't always get one because they're so spread out. All right, I'm gonna do a couple more turns here at the bottom. Get the stuff that I, what I call overs, incorporated into the really wet part of the bin here. Yep, I was hoping for a worm ball, but no bueno. That's okay, you're still good worms. All the food is gone, which is the point. And then we make our, our empty space here to add the new food and the new bedding. Try and pick through everything here. All right, let's go get them some bedding. This is my prepared bedding here that has uh, shredded cardboard and paper and has got a little bit of uh, seaweed extract in there as well as grit. I generally put the grit into the bedding so that I don't forget to do it, or if I do forget, then it doesn't really matter. Okay, let's get them a good feeding. This is a two gallon bucket. So they're going to get two gallons of pumpkin. This is going to be super fast food because it has already started to break down. So then they're also going to get the kitchen scraps for the week, which includes, um, onions and peppers, some bread. I should probably put that underneath here so it gets wet. Otherwise, if you don't get bread wet, it will uh, kind of turn into a rock. All right, so that's two pounds, maybe three pounds. I don't think it's enough. Hold on. With there being most likely 20 pounds of worms in here, I'm feeding on a scale that most people don't see. So I do not recommend feeding your worms seven or eight pounds of food if you do not have a 55 gallon bin. So that was two, two gallons. Then here's some more avocados, some more bread. So I'm feeding the equal of about five gallons of food. Here's some melon. That really looks like it would smell terrible, but it doesn't for some reason. I'm not sure what that is. Cornmeal or something. But the melon, avocado, that'll all, the avocado will be slow, the melon will be fast, um, half dead, squishy radishes will be very fast, the bread will be in between. Banana peels are kind of an in-between food, usually takes three to four weeks. Let's get them some more bedding for on top. 
So now I'm gonna give them a five gallon bucket full of bedding to cover up that food. That will prevent the um, critters in the basement, you know, flies or whatever, from smelling that particularly tasty bunch of food. So there we have the, the wedge method as it is. Here's the brand new feeding zone, which is about a quarter of the bin. Here's the part that we dug out and kind of excavated. It takes up a quarter of the bin. Here is the almost finished, still has a lot of worms, but it's also almost finished. And then the far end of the bin, which is about a quarter, is the finished casting that I'm waiting for them to dry out. Now blue, the 55 gallon bin, has its own playlist. And I will link the playlist right over there. And if you don't like that, check out this video over here that YouTube thinks that you will like to watch. All right guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms and everybody have a good day.